This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. Well, Dan, how are you doing? Welcome to the Bristol Flyers podcast. Yes, thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm not too bad actually. Did you listen to the Did you listen to the first episode of the pod with Andreas and Nick? And Nick, yeah, I did actually. I heard a little bit of it. Um, it's talking a little bit about like the recruiting process and some of the players that he's bringing in and what he's looking to do for the team next year. It's been a crazy few months with the whole COVID-19 situation and everything that's been going on. How have you been dealing with the, the lockdown period? Oh, man, great question. Um, been dealing with it one day at a time, you know. It's kind of like ever since the last game against Glasgow and everything now has just been uh, put on hold, basically, ever since that last game. Season's basically over. And... Um, now it's kind of like taking the time and attention and focusing it on things that you can personally do to, I guess, like you say, ease, ease, your, ease yourself through the lockdown period or the whole isolation period. And, you know, I've, I've actually been kind of missing the gym over the last few few weeks, if not a month or so. So I'm just like, <laughs> I'm really itching to get in the gym sometime soon. But other than that, though, keeping myself uh, physically active and trying to stay fit. You know, with me and Alice was doing, a, we've done a couple of things um, in terms of like fitness wise, like whether that's personal fitness or as you saw, like that 4 4 24 challenge. We've started up a new food page, uh, plant based vegan food page, and just trying to like, you know, promote like healthy living or healthy diet, dietary wise stuff. Um, and I'm big on cooking. I love food. I love cooking food, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been like one of those like, Take your time out and just open up your mind to things that you may want to do in the future or just try to like create a whole new life for yourself, I guess you could say. Yeah, I think when the lockdown first started, I think I was a bit like, oh, okay, it's a good chance to unwind a little bit, sort of take your foot off the gas a little bit. There was that period when the league was suspended but not quite finished you know they still left the door open for a potential return and and that kind of allowed me to get a bit of downtime because during the season it's just so full on isn't it like you don't really you don't really get a chance to you know the, the games come thick and fast you have training throughout the week you know sometimes double headers you have the midweek games sometimes I mean I don't know about you but I felt like it was a good chance to kind of almost unwind a little bit but now I'm getting to that point in lockdown where I just want basketball to come back now but yeah, no, it could get hectic with like double headers. Like, I, I swear it's been like the last five seasons I've been with the Flyers where like we always have double headers towards the end of the season, like <laughs> especially like March, April sort of thing. Um, I want to say late March and all the whole month of April. It's like we have Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, you know, sort of thing. We have like a game on Sunday, but then, you know, next week we have a game on Friday sort of thing. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about you. I always find this uh, Surrey right at the end of the season. It's <laughs> always, always it's always Surrey scorchers. It's always away as well. Surrey, Surrey or Manchester, one of the two. No, but then no, definitely is Surrey though. I, I, over the last few years, it has been Surrey. You mentioned some of the things you've been doing away from the court, like reading books and and listening to podcasts. You've been listening to many podcasts at the minute. You know what? I was listening to podcasts earlier on in the lockdown sort of thing. Um, listening to a couple of like therapeutic podcasts in terms of like mindfulness and um and like hypnotherapy kind of sort of thing it's interesting you mentioned some of the mindfulness stuff i've started listening i've started um on the headspace app i don't know if you've heard of that it's like a mindfulness app it helps you to meditate and you can do different things uh like it's different there's one that helps with like sports performance or one which helps with like concentration or one which helps you sleep if you're traveling to sleep and stuff there's different programs you can do on it I just want to talk to you a little bit about your um, running for homelessness. I know you did uh, recently did the, the four miles every uh, four hours for twenty four hours, and and you raised um, and you raised some money for for UK homelessness. How much did you raise in the end? It was somewhere like sixteen, seventeen hundred pounds or something like that. And the purpose as to why we did it is just because, like, during this lockdown and during this period of time, like, so many places have been hit. Like, you think from everywhere like from business to services that provide things for the homeless and for, for the youth as well and um so yeah and it's just kind of like you know you think about homelessness and you know sharing a little bit of my story like being a young uh being a young young person who experienced like levels of homelessness and stuff like that um you know it was it was hard because it was times where like 
went days without eating or went days without certain things or those things that you that are essential to like you know being a human being or even living from a day to day basis and you know there's kids in this world that aren't receiving that so um just thought I might do something locally and just kind of raise a little bit of awareness and and help to also understand that there are those or help to share that there are those that are in need so you know let's not forget those who who are oftentimes forgotten about you know hopefully uh in the next few months you know we'll put some things together we're trying to like work with a couple of shelters and like programs and organizations uh around this sort of stuff and just try to get a feel for um what how is it that we can best help and how is it that we can best serve so you know with everything going on now it's just like okay kind of people maybe getting back to work some people are still being furloughed or you know some people may be let go of so it's just like you know it's just networking and trying to find uh who to be in touch with and who to be in contact with as to what we can do so yeah and i know it's such a, a a subject really close to your heart from from personal experience as well so hats off to you for for doing that as such a fantastic achievement one of the things i wanted to go through with you on the podcast for for this episode was in particular your basketball journey because it's a great story in terms of your progression and, and then to come back to the uk and then play for the flyers what kind of age were you when you first started playing basketball Okay, so when I was here in England, I was actually going to Winterbourne Boys Academy, and it's in uh, it's it's located in Norbury in South London, and um, there was there was they used to have like a basketball court, but the basketball court was a bit like dense. It was one of those like English, <laughs> one of those English typical backboards, you know, like like wood on the back and then a rim, a rim attached to a piece of wood hanging off the back wall, you know, of of, of, a, of the old building or whatever the case is. And, um, yeah, they had a couple of them, and I was just kind of playing basketball a little bit there, but I was playing for fun, nothing serious. And I wasn't even that good at it anyway. So, uh, But then it wasn't until I moved to America and uh, started watching a couple of basketball players play, but I was this was during the time when I was going through everything in terms of, like, poverty and, like, homelessness and stuff. And um, and I remember I remember going to the shop, after watching a couple of these basketball players and I remember going to the shop and I, I bought like a basketball and uh, I went up to a park, not too far away, far away from a shelter where I was staying at. And, um, and I ended up starting like play basketball a little bit there, but I was just playing by myself, just like, you know, have, have fun with like different moves and stuff like that and try to learn how to make layups. And um, where, where I was staying at in Los Angeles, California in Union, in Union Rescue Mission, which is located in Skid Row itself, uh, there was like this youth club around the corner. And and by the way, I'm going on, I'm actually 12 now. So well, I'm 12 and I started playing a little bit of basketball here in England when I was well, probably about 10, 11 maybe. That's, that's when I was in Norbury. Um, but anyway, so with this youth organization, um, that's revolved for young people. They usually they usually would take kids on a Sunday and would go up to like a park, and but I didn't really know each one of them individually. So technically, it's kind of like just playing pickup for fun, you know. So, um, so yeah, and then, and then after that, uh, end up playing a little bit more like in the shelter with like uh, a youth mentor that was there and stuff like that, and playing with the other kids. So it was like almost like an afternoon, um, mid afternoon sort of like you know, young person's activity uh, program through the program, or whatever. And it wasn't until like, then I got into foster care and I actually started playing different sports. And then I started actually playing basketball uh, when I was 13 for a couple of different uh, local teams, local like AAU teams. So one of them was LA City Wildcats. After after playing with them, I just it's it's just it just went up from there. And I was just playing with them for my whole high school career or high school journey, and then I ended up you know playing uh playing in Texas and then moving to Iowa like later on down the line sort of thing. But yeah, so I definitely started taking it more seriously when I was fourteen, fifteen. I was reading online that um, when you were playing at high school, obviously you missed out your your freshman year um, because you, you you broke your tibia. Yeah, I did. Um, unfortunately, I had to get surgery. So what happened was when I was 14 and I was playing for LAC, the Wildcats, which I mentioned earlier, uh, I was basically just warming up 
for a game. But I was I was at an age where I was able to jump, but I was I, I was jumping, but I wasn't able, and I was trying to dunk, but I wasn't able to put the 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 ball in the rim. And so I tried to take off in many different ways, um, whether that's one foot or two foot takeoffs. But because of the jumping and the 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 sort of like growth that was going on at the time, like I was putting a lot of impact on my knees, my knees and you know, my body mobility and stuff like that. So it was a, it was it was like a Sunday morning. I tried to take off and then midway in takeoff in warm-ups, my something just gave out like boom, right? And I remember taking off and I felt on the takeoff something wasn't right because I I just let the ball go and I just had my hands like in a position as though I'm ready to land, like something didn't feel right, right? Anyway, I fell, I remember falling and um I was passed out for a few minutes. And then I ended up waking up and I felt like something was not right. Like I couldn't move. I didn't want to move for some reason. I remember people like looking up, like like standing over me, asking me, am I okay sort of thing. And I, I felt like I was paralyzed for a moment, like, like in, in so much shock sort of thing. So they called the paramedics and paramedics came and they put me out, they put me on a stretcher. And next thing I know, I find myself in the hospital. Next thing I know, they take an x-ray of my knee and they said, uh, they, they come back and say, oh, you have a snap tibia. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, 14, 15, I'm like, it's, a, it's, it's an emotional shock because you think like, this is the end of my career. You know, I'm not going to be able to ever play basketball again. You know, it's by the time I start walking, you know, I'm not going to be 100% like I was before sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, the, just the, the, just the sort of like psychological trauma that was like taking place in this very fine moment and then realizing that I also have to have surgery. I'm thinking like, wow, okay. And so they put three screws in my knee and put it all, um, put it all like, they like put one, two at the top, they have two at the top and then they have one underneath. And yeah, just it's still in my knee now. I mean, somebody asked me, um, would I ever get those taken out? And I was like, well, it's kind of been in my knee for the last 13 years. So it's, and it hasn't really given me much of a problem. Yeah. I mean, you obviously, you had the surgery made full recovery and then you worked hard and you got that scholarship to junior college in Texas. And then I guess that in turn helped you get onto Iowa state. What was that experience like at junior college? So, oh man, when I was a senior, so when I graduated from high school, uh, it was it was all sorts of uncertainty because I hadn't signed anywhere. Like I didn't sign to any Division One team. I was thinking about going to prep school, maybe the junior college route. And this is when I was in California, and I remember like being as being in a position where I'm thinking like, well, dang, what do I do next? Like, you know, I, I was thinking about maybe going to my 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 uh, social service provider. Or social work and asking her, you know, if I could get a scholarship in terms of like going academically in in, in California um, or something like that. And it wasn't till I received it was one day I received this random phone call, right? Um, and by the way, I was also playing like AAU in an attempt to get another Division One scholarship, but still nothing came about. So after like AAU and stuff, I got this random phone call from a head coach. Um, out of Texas, and this was a this was at the junior college, Tyler Junior College, actually. And and the basketball the the, the basketball head coach, he called me up and said, "Hi, is this Danny Dozy?" I'm like, uh, "Yes." <laughs> He's like, "Hi, my name is uh, such and such from um, Tyler Junior College, and I'm the ba- I'm the head coach for the basketball team." Um, and they was just saying like, "Yeah, you're." I heard I heard some information, or I heard somebody pass me along your name, and. A, B, and C, and we just thought I just want want to get to know you a little bit and ask you about some stuff, send you some information, and see what you think of the campus. And so I'm like, okay, looked into the campus, looked into the campus, started looking at like some of the things around it, and I I looked and I saw that it was in Texas, and I was like, okay, Dallas uh, is literally in Tyler, which is only two two hours away from tech from Dallas, or Tyler is only two hours away from Dallas. And and then I was like, all right, that's not too bad. I guess I have my aunt in Texas. Maybe I could go see her if that's worst case scenario. 
But other than that, I had no sort of like ties to Texas, like nothing that I could really thought think of where I was like, oh yeah, I want to go to Texas. Let's go, you know. Uh, but I was I was thinking about the next thing and then, like the next opportunity. Like I was ready to get out of California and ready to kind of like go and pursue, you know, an opportunity to play Division One. And so um, they so he so then after some time, uh, he the, the head coach for Tyler Junior College. He ended up he ended up saying, "Oh, I'd like to make you an offer. I'd like to offer you a full ride scholarship. Everything's paid for." Nothing coming out of your pocket. You have the apartment. Yo, you have somewhere to stay. You have uh, free meals. You have A, B, and C. You have all the things that you need, basically. So I just thought, okay, you know what? It's not. That's not a bad. That's not a bad option. Two years at a junior college. You know, in a place that maybe I'm ready to get out. Like I said, I'm ready to get out of of California. Well, you know, why not take a chance? Let's see what's going to happen. Let's see what comes out of it. And uh, yeah, went went to went to Tyler Junior College. Stayed there two years. Met some unbelievable people. Uh, some people I'm still in contact with now. And then um, after that second year, it was like, oh, starting that second year at Tyler Junior College, which is basically my sophomore year. Uh, we end up just well, end up having like scholarships from from different teams or from different schools and stuff like that, like Minnesota, Iowa State. Uh, I think. I think Rice was one of them. Not Rice. It might have been Rice. Might have been Rice. Uh, Oregon was there as well. And then we had um, there's another school, Minnesota. Uh, not Minnesota. It was Mississippi State, I believe. And then University of North Texas, UNT, I believe, was over there. It was also there. And I think Texas A&M, if I'm not mistaken. So had a few really good names and a really few good like sort of looks and whatnot. And then. It wasn't till I, I signed with Iowa State in November of 2012, going into that 2013, uh, going into that 2013 year. So, and how did that come about? Well, initially I wasn't going to go to Iowa State. I was actually going to go to Minnesota, and uh, because I was Minnesota and Iowa State were both made an offer sort of thing. And um, so I had my mind set on Minnesota because I was like, I went to Minnesota, took a visit there, and I thought I fell in love with the city. Amazing. Loved it. Like, loved every bit about it. Loved the campus. The campus is right in the heart of the city, you know, like literally in the heart of the city. Um, And I just felt like, I almost felt like the people there were amazing as well. Like some of the team, some of the guys that was playing on the uh, on the team, uh, and then um, unfortunately, so then I told Iowa State after I, I I went to Minnesota, took a visit there, and then came back to Texas and told my college coach I'm like I want to go to Minnesota, and he said uh, okay yeah no worries yeah we got this basketball tournament coming up so they say they're gonna fly down come see you play a little bit. And then um, uh, they came and saw me play in that tournament. Like we had like three, four games or whatever. And I assume they went off that first game and they wasn't really happy about it. Or maybe they may have had somebody else in the pipeline. Maybe they just want to make, make the offer to me, whatever the case is. And um, they pulled out of the deal. It was quite interesting. And then, you know, after that, I was like, dang, so now I don't have a scholarship. And then my head coach uh, for Tyler Junior College called uh, Fred Hoiberg, who was the head coach at Iowa State at the time, and was telling me the situation that was going on. And um, well, a couple of the assistant coaches came down, saw me play in like our practice, and a couple of games as well. As well, and they was uh, they was actually happy, and they said that yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, they made an offer and stuff like that, and we'll consider you know consider coming in back and st- uh, consider him back on the table, and. Um, yeah, just after that, after I found out that Iowa State was willing to make a to give a scholarship to me as well, or to me or for my situation, and everything, I was like, okay, you know, what? take Iowa State. And and then you went into to Iowa State. You had two years there, and 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 you quite successful years, like winning the Big Twelve championship twice, uh, making the NCAA tournament twice, and then obviously one time going to the Sweet Sixteen, and then the second time going out in the first round, but. Uh, was that, was that a big step up from from where you were at junior college? Oh, hands down, hands down. It was it was a massive step up. Um, in fact, like it was it was a it was a step up 
in a crowd sense as well. When we got when we got to Iowa State and we started like I started seeing like cheese like it's like fifteen thousand people in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like playing in front of this many people. Like and even even then, like that's only that's that's a small that's a small level. Like that's a small number uh, in comparison to some of like the other universities around the country. But however, however, the I say I would stay all day. Most lit. Um, most lit crowd I've ever played in front of, you know, in comparison to anywhere else. Like, especially when it was a home game and we was playing against like a big team, whether that was like, uh, let's say if it was like Kansas, uh, Kansas Jayhawks, or like, especially when it came to like Iowa, um, University of Iowa, because, you know, those are like crosstown rivals, much much like Plymouth and Bristol, which I'm, you know, if, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, but it was it was actually it was it was very lit. It was actually lit, like especially when we went somewhere else. Like let's say you mentioned about the Big Twelve tournament championships. Like we our first year, well, in fact, both years when we got to like the championship title, um, like the title game, it was it was ninety five percent Iowa State fans, <laughs> especially my second year. You know, so our home games were always packed out, almost sold out. You know, playing in front of like fifteen thousand fans. And they always love, they love basketball. You know, they have a high passion for it. You know, shout out to Cyclone Nation. Um, I, I still ain't forgot about them. You know, I just, I just thought, just think like, yeah, it was, uh, those times were actually like genuinely fun. And yeah, it's just, it, it, and then also too, with like my head coach, uh, Fred Hoyerberg, you know, he taught so much of the game in a way where it's like, oh, okay, I can see like what you're trying to do here. I can see how you're trying to put guys in a success, successful position. You know, at the end of the day, he's worried about winning games and trying to make sure that everybody, uh, trying to make sure that he's leading the basketball team in the right direction. So, um, and then playing and and then watching him like move up in the rankings from college to NBA, along with other, with with my other teammates as well at that time, like you know Monte Morris or George Niang or uh, Naz Mitchell Long, Matt Thomas now who's with the Toronto Raptors. Um, uh, Deontay Burton, I didn't play with him, but he was like a, he was like a, 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 a red-shirted player, uh, my senior year. And when I left, he ended up becoming like one of the main, main guys to play sort of thing. I imagine that experience of playing with those guys that who, who've gone on to play at such a high level also, uh, under Fred Hoiberg, who obviously went on to go and coach the Bulls for a little while. I guess that, that experience and, and you sort of being part of that team must have done wonders for, for your development, both on and off the court. Yeah, in a sense, of course. Um, I think I was still I was so raw. I was so raw at the time, and uh, with with having a lot to learn, it was just kind of like okay, you know, I just, I, I kind of had to accept the fact that I wasn't going to play as much, you know. And I, I think um, it was it was always a tough pill to swallow, time in, time out, sort of thing, you know. But then you know, having those guys around and watching them play, you know, it was, it was always like interesting to watch because. I was like, damn, okay, these guys are coming in like 40, 50 minutes before practice and they all they already got up like 500 shots sort of thing, you know what I mean? Or they already are doing like ball handling stuff. And um, and yeah, they already have like, they're already watching film or they, they're already like, you know, studying a game or they're watching tape, whatever the case is. And yeah, so it was, it was always like an interesting thing to look at. Um, with how much like these guys actually put their time into the game, so yeah, you know, like they say, hard work pays off. Yeah, you, you talk about that competition for minutes as well. I think there was um, uh, an NCAA tournament game. I think it might have been your first year at Iowa State. I think it was when George Niang broke his foot, and, and then you kind of stepped up. I think you played around fifteen or sixteen minutes um, against North Carolina. I think it was, and you guys ended up coming away with the win. Yeah, actually, we just came off of like the Big Twelve tournament championship, uh, like that run, and I remember playing a few minutes there. So my confidence was all right; was actually all right at the time. Uh, but then the second game where George Niang, you know, reportedly broke his foot, and then realized we won that game, and then now we're going to play UNC the next game. I was like, okay, <laughs> like this is a big deal, sort of thing. So, and now coach is uncertain because. He doesn't know who to really put in, but, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to put someone else who's been here for some time. I've, this is my first year here, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, 
you know, like, don't put me in, but put me in sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to shine on the big stage, Dan. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Let me mentally get ready and stuff. But yeah, end up playing, um, end up playing that game, and and then we and then we won the game um, with DeAndre Kane's buzzer beat. I believe it was like a like not buzzer beat. It was like a layup within the last few seconds because. And then we was like, holy smokes, we're off the sweet 16. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was a big moment. Would you say that was your like standout moment or your 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 best, your fondest memory from your time at Iowa State? I think my first year, right? My first year, um, in fact, it was that same season as well. We played BYU away. <laughs> B and BYU is like one of the powerhouses in collegiate sports or even collegiate basketball so remember a couple of minutes into the game and it's probably like 10 minutes 10 minutes on the clock it's like deandre kane has like two fouls melvin Nedjim has like two fouls george Yang has like two fouls and you know it's just like oh this is good this seems like to be a physical game sort of thing you know and so, so yeah, it was, it was, it actually, and it actually was a physical game because then the coach decided to put me in, and I was like, wow, this game is actually quick, like it's faster than what it actually looks like, and actually what it feels like as well. So, um, but then it wasn't till like, it wasn't till like a minute left that I ended up, I ended up getting a game winning block, and I was like, okay, you know what I mean? Like in this moment, that's okay, you know, let's go, no, 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 not today, sort of thing, you know. <laughs> 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 so anyway, I got the rebound back and then um it was literally like eight seconds left. And if I made either one of the two free throws, it would have made it a two possession game. So if I made both, great. If I made one, that would have been great as well. Um then anyway, got to the free throw line and I remember, oh man, I was so nervous at the free throw line. Literally, I just I j- I just been thrown in at the last minute, you know what I mean? Like because someone else fouled out. And I haven't shot free throws as much in this sort of pressure, pressurized sort of situation. So anyway, the first one I missed, uh, I kind of missed it bad, actually. And then the second one, I banked it. And hey, happy days. <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of my, that's another fun moment of, of my years playing at Iowa State. And then my senior year, too. I also had a couple of like, highlights here and there. But yeah, definitely, definitely those two. Yeah, and then you and then you graduated from Iowa State. Was um was playing professionally always on the cards for you? Is that something you wanted to do? Uh, when I was younger, I sound old saying that. <laughs> during, no, during that time, uh, I was actually thinking about just playing ball. Like I wanted to see if I could make the NBA. But when I transferred to the to to Iowa State, I was like, okay, I'm. Let them be a bit more realistic because it doesn't look like I'm actually going to make it. And even if I was to put the work in, then, you know, I don't know. So I, didn't, I wasn't too confident. In fact, in fact, coming up, stumbling up, um, uh, across that sort of like realization kind of made me think for a moment as to like, well, what am I going to do if things don't work out the way that I wanted it to? So, you know, it kind of got to a point where you got to kind of see what your other options are. Well, I definitely say when I was in uh, foster care, when I was growing up, going through high school, yeah, like making making the NBA sort of thing, or even just playing. But ba- I guess playing basketball as a professional was something that was an idea. It was, it was an ideal, like an ideal sort of situation. And it wasn't until like recently, um, maybe a few, the last few years, I've actually thought about becoming a psychologist. So, which I think that probably works well with my personality and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I know you. You played in that Las Vegas summer league, and and that's kind of how you got in touch with with uh, Andreas. What was that process like? Did you get yourself an agent, and then they recommended sort of going into that summer league? Did I get Did I get an agent? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't get an agent agent just for that summer league. But I did sign with an agent right after graduation. In fact, he was a Greek agent, and um, it was funny because on Facebook. I got a me- I received a message from the guy who runs the whole thing and he said, Oh, hey, you know, Mr. Doji, yeah, we've heard a little bit about you. We'd like for you to come. We would like to invite you to a basketball showcase here in Las Vegas. You know, all you have to do is just pay for your flight and hotel and everything else is taken care of, sort of thing. So I thought, all right, uh, let's see what we could do then. <laughs> see how see how this goes, right? 
And so, uh, yeah, so got received some support, which I'm so grateful for. Every like, I'm grateful. I'm genuinely grateful. For. I I don't even know how to repair, but I, all I could do is just keep doing, you know, who, who I am and who I am as a person, and keep on giving back, sort of thing. But receive so much support, and um, and yeah, you know, <laughs> now to this day, in fact, this, this story is actually going to make me cry if I start saying it, but. Uh, yeah, so I received some money uh, to for like funding to like get to this Las Vegas, and then I met like the head coach. He ended up like you say, put me in touch with Andreas, and and then Andreas reached out. You know, we or I reached out to Andreas, and then we just started talking from there. And during that time as well, I just met my siblings. So I met my, I, I, I just became familiar with my sister, who I've never seen before, but I was talking to her over like Skype or. FaceTime and stuff like that. And then my brother came to America once. And um, after that, I never saw him again. So I just told him, you know, if the opportunity in England presents itself to to where I could come play, then I'll definitely take it. And so then coach was, you know, from Bristol, he was, he was making an offer and stuff like that. And I looked in the Bristol and I thought, oh, wait a minute. Like, Bath is only 25 minutes away from Bristol, which is where my sister lives. So um, I just thought, you know what, that's something worth taking for, you know what I mean? But then also I had an agent at the time who was also trying to get me into Greece as well. So uh, I was a bit like, uh, kind of off on the table here already. But then I have an agent and he hasn't, but he hasn't yet to get me an offer. So it's kind of like, uh, which one do I take, you know? And I just kind of started, I started to put, I started to really think about, okay, what is it that I actually want? You know, I thought like playing for Bristol, coming back to England will probably be, uh, a, a, it's not It's not like you're coming for the wrong reasons. I mean, you're coming to like try and reconnect with family and, I don't know, make an establishment for yourself sort of thing. So uh, especially not seeing my mom over the last, like, well, at that time, I didn't see my mom since 2008, seven or eight or something like that. And then 2015, you know, coming back to England, it was the first time I saw my mom. So um, there was that. And then, my, my, like I said, my sister and my brother, who I never met before, well, especially my sister, uh, thought it'd be a great opportunity to spend some time with him and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, and then coming to Bristol and, you know, kind of uh, being a part of a growing organization was like another positive thing as well. So, And that was just complete by chance that, you know, Coach Kapoulis from Flyers just reaches out to you and you've got a chance to come home and not, not only just come home, but actually be 25 minutes away from, from your family. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just like, it's like, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like, the, um, it's like that, it's like that sort of golden nugget in hindsight. You know what I mean? It's like, there's, there's, there's a perfect reason, you know, to, to go here. Like, yeah, but no, I'm grateful, grateful, just all pure gratefulness and gratitude towards how life has been over the last few years. And what, there, won't, there won't be one day or there won't be one thing that I would ever try and change or take, take away from like how the journey has been so far because everything has has led up to where I'm at now for a positive purpose. So, you know, it's it's like if there was one thing I would I would kind of like implement more if if I if I was to say to my old self or to my yeah if I was to say to my old self, right? Right now with what I know, what would what would what would it be? Like what would I tell my old self to do? It's just to stay positive and stay and, and and also too like be mentally prepared like in anything that you do like whether that's on a daily basis or even in life like you know don't take things too seriously but when you know you need to take something seriously then make sure you're like locked in sort of stuff so um yeah you know I think that's I think that's one thing that I would definitely tell my old self. So you arrive in Bristol and uh, and you get off the plane day one. Uh, flyers. I think it was like our second year in BBL. So, what was that experience like, and and kind of how much has the would you say the clubs changed off the court over the last five years? It was so weird to be back in England. I was like, oh, back in England, and then but this time now I'm much more aware, like with everything going on, right? And um, yeah, I think <laughs> so. I think what really what really got me interested, or what really got me 
like reminded me I'm um, in England was when I first got into Andreas's car and the steering wheel was on the right side of the car as opposed to the left. I was like, dang, this is weird. I'm on the I'm on the left side of the vehicle. <laughs> like a typical American coming into England when everything's opposite, you know. So um but yeah, no, and then just driving in a car with Andreas and then driving on the left side of the road, uh, and then just going through Bristol a little bit. Like he was showing me a couple couple bits about Bristol, like, yeah, there's Bristol, you know, there's that, there's suspension bridge, there's A, B, and C. I was like, okay, cool, cool. I'll be honest, I was I, I was actually a bit tired. Um you know, because it was a long flight, but at the same time, I was very excited, you know, and, and I was like, okay, you know, ready for this next opportunity, ready, I was really more ready to, like, meet my sister, and also go see my mom in London, and, um, and, and also, like, wait, couldn't wait to see my brother, because, you know, I met my brother once, and I was like, yeah, I want to meet him again, sort of thing, so, um, yeah, you know, and, and then, like, when we got to 921, uh it, it was a it was like okay you know it's so it's, it's a roof over your over your head you know it's not a, there's not a lot of people on the on, on the planet that has that you know so um just gra- grateful for having somewhere to sleep sort of thing and then you know if if to, if we were to go a little bit further um being here for the last six years or well, five years i mean you could feel that the nature of how everything is run is completely different from like you know you're thinking from like the team management side to the commercial side to now, you know, coaches responsibility and stuff like that. And I think like what's been the biggest benefit too is also having volunteers as well. Like that's one of the massive things that's also helped drive this, this whole, this whole like growth of the Bristol flies and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, you know, just like uh, with, 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 with the growth and receiving a bit more, like, like you say, like sponsorships or a bit more rec- recognition, like with, especially not just with the Bristol Flyers, but also with basketball here in England, you know, it's like one of the top, that's, I mean, it's tough. Cause it's like, it, it's one of the top sports played, but it's not like written down on paper, like in terms of like, Oh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, bass, like everybody knows about it. But you know, if, if I'm honest with you, right. I remember a few years, maybe even a couple of years, even even last year, like there's been people that said they've never even heard of basketball teams in the UK. You know, and I'm like, basketball exists or or people just, just people aren't really informed about it. I mean, the marketing behind it, you know, the push behind it. I mean, but then also boils down to how much is played in schools and you know, where's the where's the professional teams around? Because everybody thinks, oh, when they think basketball, they think NBA. Yeah, no, just that, just that alone has also, um, like that bit of raised awareness has helped grow basketball here. Like now, if you go into Bristol City Center, you know, it's, it's 40, 50 percent chance likely that someone has heard about basketball, if not the Bristol Flyers sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, particularly like in Bristol, football and rugby, they've always taken precedence. But since we're able to tap into rugby audiences, we're able to tap into to football audiences. And and I think that's only going to grow over the next few years, of course, because of the, the plans for the new venue as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's great. I mean, you know, I think uh, with, 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 with some conversation that, that has been had in terms of like, oh, you know, like you have the stadium right next to the football stadium or whatever, which is really, which is really interesting because there's been some things around where Bar- is it FC Barcelona or Real Madrid that does that? I think it's Barcelona. Barcelona. Both of them do have a top basketball team as well, but like with Barcelona, you do have that model where the the basketball arena it literally is right next to the stadium. I think it's one of the things that Steve Lansdowne said when he first started the Bristol Sport Vision was that he went into the museum at um at Barcelona and he walked in there and it wasn't only just football trophies there was basketball trophies um there were there other sports that they have but he he went in there and that was what kind of inspired him to to get involved and to kind of build this multi-sport model that's one of the things that's lacking in terms of like playing basketball it's just because of the indoor facilities which that's something that I I think like I say if I had the money to I would definitely do that because it's what's needed to help grow the sport. I mean, it sucks when you go to like SGS or you go to UE and you know you got you got you got the whole sports um, center on all all the gym floors booked out because of indoor hockey or something like that. You know, or 
you have it, you, you go to like SGS or you go to some of these schools and whatnot and like they use the, the sports facility for everything. You know what I mean? Well, you look at the, you look at the floor, it's like a London tube map, isn't it? With all the different color lines on it. Yeah, exactly. Like you got blue, green, white, red, yellow. You, you're like, where's the basketball court? Like, <laughs> <laughs> at least at SGS they have the the red paint so you can kind of see it a bit better and uh, I guess they do, you know the, our volunteers do a great job on game day as well when you know you look at you look at the court on game day and it's completely transformed like you know they have the the court colored tape over all the lines that aren't basketball lines and you know it looks fantastic on camera doesn't it yeah no and I respect that so much because sometimes in a game it, it does get a bit confusing or it can you can you can you can be looking like on the ground like let's say you at the free throw line you're shooting and you see <laughs> then sometimes you're thinking like all oh, these dang lines anyway <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully fingers crossed it can only grow going forwards one of the last things I, I wanted to cover was what's next for you like I know you're doing a lot of motivational speaking right now I mean how many more years of your playing career do you feel you've got left in you Oh man, depends, you know. Um, as long as I'm keeping myself physically healthy, and then I could say next four or five years potentially. But just kind of trying to stay in the moment, you know, not trying to think too much of it. But yeah, I want to say like, you know, if 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 basketball was to be done tomorrow, it would definitely be motivational speaking and working with young people, and then kind of building from there. So I think what lockdown's proven is that a lot of players have started to think about life after basketball because once they retire, I mean, you've seen like Greg Street, for example, go and become a firefighter. You, you could even like experience the injury, you know, and it could be a career ending injury. And it's like, you know, you got to recover from that. And now it's like, what do you do? You know, you could like, that's what I've been doing over these last few years. You know, while, while you're playing sport, it's great. You can play sport. I mean, this is something I've always been told. It's great while you play sport, but make sure you have a plan B like put in place, you know, and you and you're so confident in your plan B that that once you get through with plan A, plan B is like okay, let's go. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like let's go. Like I'm 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 in it for the long run, sort of thing. So yeah, I think I I think that's a great place for us to kind of wrap things up. I mean, I think I speak for a lot of people in Bristol when I say that you are that inspirational figure to a lot of kids. Uh, and just with your story in general like and your, and your positive mindset and everything, you've really become uh, an inspiration to a lot of people in this city. Thanks a lot for your time, Dan. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, let's hope we can do this face-to-face sometime soon. Fingers crossed and we can get back out there on the basketball court. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast.